Hey guys, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, making twist Damascus fittings for a K-Bar tribute knife. So I'm working on a knife right now that will be, you know, sort of a K-Bar tribute knife. Uh, for those of you who aren't knife nerds, that's essentially the knife that was used by the U.S. military during World War II and for many years thereafter. The original K-Bar has a disc-shaped pommel and then this really super cheap stamped metal cross guard. That's no fun. So our knife is going to substitute twist Damascus for both of these parts. Today, I'll be showing how I fabricated these two fittings. We'll start by stacking up alternating pieces of carbon steel and a nickel steel called 15 and 20. Nickel doesn't corrode very easily, so later on we'll etch the steel and the nickel will etch only minimally, whereas the carbon steel will etch fairly aggressively. And that'll leave a strong visual contrast between the two steels, which in turn will show off the pattern that we're going to show how to make here today. The pieces are now tack welded just enough to keep them from falling apart in the next stage. Here, the billet goes into the forge where it's heated up to about 2400 degrees Fahrenheit. See, the steel is now so hot that under just a little bit of pressure, it'll actually stick together and form a single block of material. That's accomplished using this forge press. The resulting steel block is then drawn out into a bar. After that, it's cooled down and ground clean. Next, we cut it up into several pieces, which are then restacked and re-welded just exactly like the first one was. The original billet had 20 layers, so 20 times 4, that now increases the layer count to 80. The billet's then drawn out into a sort of square and then massaged into a roughly round bar. Then I'll pin it into the press and twist it. Normally I do this with a good bit smaller diameter pieces, but in this case, and in a couple of other projects I'll be using this bar for, I need a fairly substantial piece of steel, over an inch in diameter. Twisting a bar of steel, even a red hot bar of steel, is pretty exhausting work, and you sure don't want to slip and jam your arm into it. After the twist, we'll square it all up and it'll be ready for the next phase. So I'll chop a couple pieces out, one for the disc shaped pommel, and a more sizable piece for the cross guard. Let's focus on the cross guard. After roughly grinding it to shape, I'll true it up on my surface grinder to make it ultra flat and square. Then I'll mill a slot for the tang to insert into. This is the sort of thing that CNC machines excel at, so I'll program the dimensions of the slot and then mill it out at a very conservative rate using a 1 8 inch end mill. Can you do this without a mill? Absolutely. Drill several holes, cut out between them with a jeweler's saw, and then file it out. Now, this is way faster and way more accurate, but both methods will work. It can all be done by hand. In the next video, I'll show how everything fits together, but obviously here we're just focusing on the fittings. Once that video is done, by the way, and that should only be a few days, I'll drop a link in the cards and description. Now I'll grind the cross guard to shape on my belt grinder. After the general shape is perfected, I'll go to higher and higher grit belts, culminating with 30 micron 3M Trizac belts.
then it's over to a mechanical buffer where I'll put a shine on the piece. As you can see, at this point, the steel is completely featureless. All that work that I put wrestling the pattern into the steel has yielded absolutely nothing yet. So just hang in there and we'll see it in a minute. Now comes the tricky part. In the original knife, the pommel is peened onto a stacked leather handle. This means that a small piece to the steel tang protrudes through the pommel and then is smashed and ground down. We won't do that because that extra piece of steel sticking up through there would screw up the Damascus pattern. So how to do that? Well, I'm solving this conundrum by brazing on a threaded insert, basically a nut onto the bottom. And this will then accept a threaded rod on the tang of the knife. A lot of problems here, potentially at least. If the threaded insert nut thingy is non-concentric or it doesn't stick well or it's canted slightly off axis, nothing's gonna fit right. So I'm leaving extra material on the outside of the pommel so that it'll be shaped to fit the handle rather than trying to make it all perfect right now and hoping that it lines up with the handle. Eventually I turned it on a lathe, though I didn't show that part here. And as it turns out, the brazing material didn't hold up very well, so I ended up having to weld on a nut. You know, welding is not exactly a precision science, so the whole thing wasn't very ideal. It worked out okay, but it was a lot more complicated than I initially anticipated. Next, I'll fit the pommel to the handle. Nothing came out particularly concentric here. So basically, I had to get everything perfectly set then grind the pommel to fit the handle rather than just turning both of them on the lathe and hoping they all lined up correctly. Again, ascending the sequence of grits to a very fine belt, then spiffing it up on the buffer. Once that's complete, we've got two shiny little items with no pattern to them. Time for the magic. Suspending them from iron wires, I'll immerse them in a very dilute solution of ferric chloride. which, as we explained earlier, etches the surface of the steel. After they come out and get cleaned up a little, they look like this. Now, we could quit here, but in this case, I'm going to niter blue the pieces. Again, using iron wire, I'm dredging the pieces in molten bluing salts. To get these particular types of steel to produce the sort of colors I like, something in the sort of blue and purple range, I heat the salts to about 675 degrees Fahrenheit. What the salts do is induce the formation of a thin layer of oxide on top of the steel. The higher the heat, the thicker the oxide layer. On the thin end, this produces yellows and golds, which then yield to browns as you get a little hotter, then blues and purple, and still hotter, you end up with a bluish silvery sort of tone if you go way up into the 700s, which I didn't. And here's the result. An awful lot of work for a couple of tiny bits of steel, but, you know, still a pretty cool result. In the next video, which is just going to be coming in a few days, I'll show how the knife finally comes together. Um, it's a really complex and interesting build. A lot of stuff that you can learn from watching it. Uh, in fact, I learned a lot of stuff myself during the making of this knife. Uh, so thanks for watching, and keep making those knives. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com. Digging the channel? You can support our video making efforts on Patreon. You know, I've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years, so I hope you'll show some love for all that hard work. Link in the cards and descriptions. Finally, if you're interested in making Japanese swords, check out my full line of Japanese sword videos where I show how to forge Japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings, handles, and scabbards. WalterSorrelsBlades.com